So good morning, everybody. Welcome to chapel. I'm going to invite everybody to stand, to stand with us this morning. We're going to sing Revelation song. We're going to start off with Revelation song. Um, and yeah, with the, with the busyness and craziness of school, going in between classes, I'm so grateful that we have a God who uh, likes spending time with us and just taking a moment um, in a crazy day to spend time with him. So I want you to pray with me this morning. Dear God, thank you so much for who it is that you are. Thank you so much for your holiness, God. Thank you that you want to spend time with us in our um, strange, crazy college lives. Thank you that uh, you're never too busy for us. And I pray that this morning, um, even though our hearts might be elsewhere, our minds might be elsewhere, I pray you'd help us to calm our hearts and quiet our hearts uh, just for this 15 minutes today, even if that's all we have, God, um, and that we would, yeah, spend a moment with you, help us to focus in, and yeah, may we just enjoy this time with you this morning. You're worthy of it all.
rushes of lightning rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and for the power of Christ and for the power of the Holy Spirit um, and just the, the excitement they felt when they were getting that this is real, like that the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus' name that we're hearing in these Bible stories and in the song we just sang, that it's real and it's today and it's here and it's now, um, that it wasn't just in the past, in the Old Testament, um, I'm taking Acts right now, that power um, that the apostles had, we have it now. Um, and the challenge of living that way and living like that's real. Um, and so as we pray this song, um, I encourage the high school and middle school students to do the same thing. I pray for the Lord to encourage your faith um, as we're singing this. Um, and pray for boldness uh, as we're talking about in Acts um, to take up this power and to, and to believe it. Um, and to live like it, and yeah, to claim it. So that's what this song is about. Um, the weekend retreat was themed, Jesus is greater than everything. Um, and uh, I wasn't gonna share this, but they had this, um, they had this time where at the end of the, the retreat, they wrote on little rocks. They all had rocks, and they were supposed to write on a rock what they were putting above Jesus, what they, in their lives, um, they had a time of prayer, they wrote down on rocks what in their lives they were putting higher than Jesus. Um, and so after this, we're going to sing Make Room. Um, and so, yeah, as you're praying through these songs, just, yeah, think in your life, what are we putting above Jesus? What do we think is greater than him? Is it a fear or is it something practical? Um, but, yeah, let's just claim the power that we have in Jesus' name this morning. This 
this is my surrender. Dear God, thank you for who it is that you are. Thank you for your name. Thank you for the power of your name. Thank you for your heart for us. Thank you that you want to work in our lives, God. Um, thank you that you want anything to do with us. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's where we're at. You are seeking after us. Thank you so much for that, God. I pray that today, um, as we listen to Pastor Aaron speak, God, that you would just anoint his words and anoint his message, and that we would all um, have open hands to receive. Um, God, and that when we leave, as this song was saying, that you would shake up the ground of all our tradition and break down the walls of all our religion, that we wouldn't just keep it here in the chapel, that we wouldn't just keep it here in Tekoa, God. Thank you for tradition and religion and those good things, but I pray that we wouldn't just keep it confined to here um, in the church, but that we would take it. And so please help us to receive the words and to apply them and to truly live out the power of your name. It's in your name we all pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we are going to continue in worship this morning by diving deeper into the book of James. So as you know, we're right in the middle of a series on James. So last, work, last week we heard some uh, fantastic messages on how James approaches the topic of perseverance and wealth. Uh, today we are focusing on the topic of faith. So uh, Mr. Aaron Santor is our featured speaker for this topic. Some of you uh, know Aaron and his wife Jennifer. They are TFC grads, and uh, during their time at TFC, they joined up with a church called Grace Fellowship, and Aaron uh, led worship there for over a decade. And after that, he transitioned to be their senior pastor, where he has been serving that role for about 10 years now. Uh, the Santors, they uh, love college students, they love TFC, and we are just so blessed to have Aaron and his family here with us, us this morning, so please uh, welcome him to the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that rowdy welcome. Um, if you haven't been to Grace, it's like that every Sunday morning. <laughs> Uh, again, as I said, my name's Aaron. I'm just going to pull these back. And uh, my wife and I, we came here in 1995 uh, from New England. Uh, we married in 1998, uh, graduated in 99, and uh, today we, uh, we have six kids, and we love Tacoa. We love living here. God has, has planted us here. It's our adopted hometown. And, uh, and like uh, Jordan said, we love Tacoa Falls College, we love college students, and our passion is, is this, uh, just so that you know our heart, is that for, for your age group, 18 to 24 years old, the people you place yourself around or under their influence, the experiences that you give yourself to will set the entire trajectory of your life. And we love the privilege and the honor of just being even a small seed of that, of that period of time. And so thank you, Jordan, for the, for the invite and the opportunity to share with you all. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Holy Spirit, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your leadership. Father, we thank you for your word. We, we thank you that, that you're always serving us. You're always speaking to us. You're always working, Lord, in our hearts. You never sleep. You, you do a work even while we sleep in us, Father. We thank you that you're faithful to your word and faithful to your people. Even when we are faithless, you remain faithful for you cannot deny yourself. We bless you and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and help us this morning. Give us understanding. Fill us with the knowledge of the Holy One. We ask right now in this room, in Jesus' name, that you would release a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to turn this on. There we go. So a number, we, we moved into a house, we built a house uh, just about two miles up, uh, up the hill here. Uh, about 18 years ago, 
And we live in the woods. We live in the national forest. So there's a lot of trees all around. And these trees fall over. Sometimes limbs come down. And so I told my wife, I need a chainsaw. She said, need, huh? I said, yes, I need a chainsaw. And as she saw the trees coming down from time to time, she said, okay, we need a chainsaw. Well, I never owned a chainsaw before. And so I went and we, we picked one up. And we thought it would do the trick. But it was, turns out the blade was too small. The engine wasn't powerful enough. It was refurbished. And so I had a lot of frustrations with it. I would, I would, it would take forever to crank up. And then once it cranked, I would go to the tree. I wouldn't even touch the tree. But just getting near the tree, it would cut off. Oh, so I had to go through the work of cranking it again. And then I would go over to the tree, and I would barely touch the tree, and the chain would fall off. And then I'd have to get all that set back up, and I'd go, and I'd get about halfway through it, and it would cut off again, or was it cutting the wood well? And, and what a terrible thing. It was so frustrating. What a terrible thing for a man to not be able to have any joy in his chainsaw. Like every time a tree or a limb would fall down, it was, oh... I've got to get out the chainsaw. Look, guys, we were meant to have dominion over the earth. Like, I should have a chainsaw that, that works, that does something. So we're having some, some work done around our house. And they had to push over some trees, and we had to clean them up. And so it cost us something. Well, I went out and I, I bought a chainsaw, a, a, a man's chainsaw, right? Big blade, big engine, sharp teeth. It's just... And, and I go out there and I am cutting through trees like a hot knife, through butter. Like I overdid it. I, I, I hurt my back because I was just so full of joy that this chainsaw was working. The chain stayed on. It's kept running. And, and there's sawdust everywhere. It was glorious. And I came in and I, and I felt the pleasure of the Lord in that moment. Like it was awesome. And I came in and I told my daughter, because it was such a, such a house before, I, I told her, I said, it was such a glorious day of, of working with this saw. And, and she teased me a little bit. She goes, imagine that, a chainsaw that works, a chainsaw that cuts wood, a chainsaw where the chain stays on it and it keeps running. And the chainsaw, it was costly and it brought me pain, but it also brought me great joy. And so I've been asked to speak uh, in James. I believe this is all. Let's give this a shot. Yeah. On, this, on the topic of faith. So we're in faith in James chapter 2. And we're going to talk about, in your Bibles, you may see a little subtitle. It says, Faith and Works, or Faith and Deeds. That's actually tech, not, not scripture that was just put in there by publishers, so we're free to kind of play with that all we want. But I want to change that today from faith and works to a faith that works. And a faith that works, it will cost you something. A faith that works, it will be painful. And a faith that works will also bring you great joy and life. So, let's start reading. So James says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Some translations read, works and you can see, just even at the bottom there, that last verse, it's the same word that's translated action. And sometimes I've always read this in the past and thought deeds, right? That's, the, that's your good deeds. It's like helping old ladies across the street, volunteering at soup kitchens, all the charitable things we do. But the word there that's used, it's very broad. It's actions. It's your, it's your deeds. It's your works. It's your actions. It's, it's the wor same word is used when, when Jesus is anointed. By, by, by a woman with perfume, she says, she has done a good work to me. Your worship is work. You're working this morning as we sang. Worship, uh, works are the words that we speak. It's how we spend our money. It's how we, how we relate to one another. It's, it's, it's how we go about our jobs. It's how you study. It's how you respond in different situations. These are your, your works. And James is calling out a faith that actually has fruit. And so James goes on, can such faith, and he uses this word, can such faith save them? So James is talking about a faith here that bears, that bears out in how we live. And that word save, the same word can be used, we could, we could change that word there. Can such faith heal them? Can such faith make them whole? Can such faith transform them? A faith that doesn't show its fruit in our works. 
James gives an example. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. James is talking about a saving faith that transforms, heals us, and has impact on those around us. And in that, there's some, there's some wrong ways to look at this passage. James is not saying that works contribute to our faith. He's saying that our, our works, our deeds, our actions, they perfect it, they fulfill it. They're the, they're the fruit of it. Even Charles Spurgeon gives this example. He says, you know, if you see a tree and it's not producing fruit year after year, then the only, the logical conclusion is it's dead. The tree is no good. And so fruits are the, are the works, the deeds that we do are like the fruits on a tree. James is not trying to get us to doubt our salvation here. If we walk out of here like, oh, I don't know, are my deeds enough? We're, we're still stuck in that works mindset. James is not trying to, to, to give us a guilt trip here. He's not trying to say what? You say, believe? Prove it. There's no table in the back for a good deeds ministry that you can sign up for. Right? Because you and I know how that works. We feel guilty for a little bit, and so we go out, we sign up for the ministry, it lasts two or three weeks, and then we just fall right back into what we were doing before. What James is calling us into, what he's, what he's pointing us towards, what he's trying to get us to lay hold of is a greater faith that will produce greater works. A greater faith that will produce greater fruit in our life. A greater fruit, a greater faith that will transform us and have greater impact on those around us. If you don't deal with the faith issue, you'll never get to the works issue. And so a faith that doesn't change us, a faith that doesn't impact those we encounter, it's useless. It's no good. It's dead. It doesn't work. James goes a little bit further. I want to talk just a little bit more about what faith is not. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I grew up in, in a, a, back, on a Christian home. Uh, we were good Baptist folk. We would go to early, ch early to church for Sunday school, and they hadn't invented children's church yet, so I got to sit through every single adult service growing up, and then we would go back early for Sunday night school. It was like a discipleship thing for before the adult evening service as well. So four times, uh, for four sessions, we were in church on Sundays, and then Wednesday night was the, was the ch kids' programs and the prayer meetings, and of course that doesn't include special meetings and revival meetings and VBSs and Christian camps and all this stuff. But what the, the Baptists are great at man, is they will drive the Word of God into you. My goodness. And so I remember being seven years old. I remember coming forward. I remember saying, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and his death paid the penalty and I trust in him and I'm giving my life to him. And then I was baptized and I had a little discipleship course that I went through with my pastor. And, I, and I, they said, you, you got to be in the word. Okay, I'm in the word. But as I grew older, I started realizing, I, I was reading the word, and I, I'm seeing this, these amazing statements in the word about the power of the blood, life in the spirit, we're free from sin, you're a new creation. But the older I got, the more my heart was exposed to me that I was full of greed and anger and lust and, and selfishness. And so I began to wait, the Bible says this, my life looks like this, there's a disconnect here. And so I, what, what, what occurred to me was, was, well, maybe when I was little like that, it didn't, it didn't, I didn't really know what I was getting into. So at 16 years old, my parents said, well, why don't you, Aaron, why don't you drive a stake in the ground? So at 16 years old, I came forward again. I got baptized again. I went through a discipleship class again. And you know what happened? Nothing. In fact, my pride got worse. My lust got worse. My anger got worse. And I had no disagreements with Scripture. Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins. My whole thought process and what the Christian life was supposed to look like is that you had 70, 80 years of holy misery, but you got to avoid hell. 
So many whole years of really trying to do what you should do, even though you really didn't want to do that. 70, 80 years, but you get to go to heaven at the end of all that. Which even that, I really wasn't sure why we're so excited about this. Streets of gold. I'd rather just have the gold. We get crowned, and then we have to give them back. There's no sex. But we get a nice room. Try selling this to a 16-year-old. And for some reason, everybody around me keeps talking about how excited they are to go there. And I'm like, I want this world. I want this life. And I had no disagreements with the tenets of Christianity. This faith didn't transform me. This faith didn't save me. This faith didn't make me whole. This faith was no better than the demons. And so what I found myself was living a life to where I would do everything I can. You know, I, I knew the scripture. That was, that was, I knew the scripture enough to play with all the loopholes. Well, technically it's not this, or technically it's this. And I didn't cross that line and still try and get as much pleasure as I could from what the world was offering. That's where that measure, that type of faith landed me. But James says, I want to contrast that with a faith that saves you, fool, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Aside from the emotional trauma of sacrificing his son, this was everything to Abraham. Understanding that culture to not have any children, it was dishonor, it was shame. But God was faithful in his promise and he removed that reproach, he removed that shame from Abraham. He was faithful to give him a son and through that son give him more promises that, 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 that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars and that all the nations would be blessed. This was more than just a child to Abraham. This was his namesake, his honor, his glory, his legacy. And God says, kill it. Put it to death. And Abraham, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, that Abraham, Abraham realized reason that God would be so, was so faithful to his word before him that he was going to be faithful to his word and continue to do so, and even if it meant having to raise Isaac from the dead. See, Abraham's faith, it worked with a complete surrender. Everything. My hope, my future, my namesake, my glory, my pride, my legacy, all of it, it's in your hands, God. I think it's interesting that that last song that we sang this morning about surrender. James goes on, he says, and he was called God's friend. called God's friend. Have you ever thought about friendship? We say friends with God and we think we're buddies. But here in this context, James is talking about friendship with God in the context of complete surrender. I'm a friend with God because I've surrendered everything to him. And even, even, even this, this, this woman Rahab, the prostitute, listen, faith works Faith worked in her to, to save even the most broken person. Faith worked in her. Even Rahab the prostitute was considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different, different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Rahab, who was completely worthy of reproach, there is nothing good about Rahab that she could say, God should show mercy to me. God should be faithful to his word as, as we see he is towards his people. There is nothing about her that would justify or, or, or would, would, would qualify her for that. But yet she put all of it on the line. Her entire life and the lives of her family. She completely surrendered and completely entrusted herself to the mercy and the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And there, while judgment was falling all around her, her family was preserved. 
She had every right to expect that when she joined the people of Israel, they would still see her as a prostitute, but yet God brought her into the lineage of Jesus. This is the work of faith. It's complete surrender. It's complete abandonment. It's complete trust. It's complete rest in the faithfulness and goodness of God. This is the work of faith. And our work in that is laboring to find that, that place. So there I was, trying to live this double life. Trying to, having a divided heart, wanting everything that the world had to offer, but still trying to, trying to cling, still trying to claim Christ. And I didn't know what to do other than I need to get out of that situation, so through a number of things, I ended up at Tacoa Falls College. And, and I'd hear the same messages, and I'd hear the same scriptures over and over again. I was like, until I see something tangible I've heard it all before, and I'm not buying it. And then it's an interesting thing. There's a lot of people who are talking about deconstruction today. But it's interesting, it's wild when God begins to deconstruct you. Because I was in a sociology class, and, and people started talking, or there's this, this teaching on, on how we get our self-worth, our self-image off of what we think other people are thinking about us. So in other words, I look at you, I see you smiling, and think, oh, they like me. Really, you're, you're probably thinking, who dressed this clown? Right? But I look, I see you smile, and I'm like, they like me, right? And then all of a sudden I realize this is just a vain imagination. It's not even real. It's something I made up in my head. I'm basing the entirety of my life on this thing. And so it just totally shut me down. And then uh, sometime later, the Lord came to me and said, do you remember your grandfather's first name? I said, it was Fred. He said, what did he do for a living? I realized I had no idea. And I realized at once, the world is going to get bored with you. You're going to die, and they're just going to move on. Who cares if I amass a fortune that's going to be spent by people I don't know? My son gets an inheritance, he buys a sports car, he's not going to be thinking, good old dad, when he cranks that sucker up. He's not going to be thinking about me. They build a monument to my name, it's a target for pension. It all comes to nothing. And so I'm in this place of just not sure what to do, but I, I know I've got to try and toe the line, walk the line here, right? So I open up my Bible, because that's what good Christians do. We should do that. It'll, it'll help me. And I come to Philippians 3, 10, and 11. And Paul says this, I want to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, that I might somehow attain the power of the resurrection. And all at once, the cross became so beautiful to me. All at once, the cross became so clear to me. The Lord said, Aaron, you have to die to all of this. And I said, God, if you're promising me, this is all I've ever wanted, was to know you and the power of your resurrection. And if you're promising me this, I give you everything. All of it. My hope, my future, my glory, my namesake, my failures. Take it all. Just let me know you. Just let me know the power of your resurrection. And I didn't get up from that place with a new resolve. I got up a new creation. I got up and my heart was transformed. This is the faith that saves us. This is the faith that heals us. This is the faith that, that makes us new. This is the faith that works. I got up completely transformed and all of a sudden I wanted nothing to do with the world and its system any longer. I wanted to, as, as, as Peter says, like he, bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. All of a sudden I want every part of my life to please him. I wanted to walk in a manner worthy of him and please him in every way. I wanted to please him with my words. I wanted to please him with my thoughts. I wanted to please him with my actions. I wanted to please him with my responses. This is faith and it was costly. It will cost you your life. There will be pain involved. But there will also be great joy. There will be resurrection power given to you. This is the work of faith. I got just a few more minutes. But as, we, as we're here today, as we leave, I'm under no illusions that because you're at a Christian college, you fully surrendered to God. But all I can promise you is, is that He's faithful. With every bit of surrender, just as we say, we give him room to work the power of the resurrection. He's given us the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead to dwell in us and to fill us. This 
is a faith that works. May it's, this is, goes beyond just agreeing with the tenets of our faith. It's costly, it's painful, but it leads to joy and life. But for those of us who have, who have experienced this complete surrender, the amazing thing is that this isn't just a once and done thing. Jesus says daily, 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 deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And there's always another level of surrender. This is a faith that works. This is the work of faith. It's going to this place deeper and deeper surrender. Have all of me, have all of me, have all of me. Have all of me. And the grace that brings salvation to all men teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Purifies us to be holy, his possession, zealous for good works. This is a faith that works in us. And so, just as we, as we close here today, I've got one minute. Where's the area of surrender? What's the Holy Spirit highlighting to you? Is it a relationship? Is it a relationship that's broken? You understand with this idea, Paul says, you know what, maybe there's a broken relationship, you've been wrong. Paul says, why not rather be wrong? If you're on the cross, what rights do you have anyway? You can surrender to your right to be right. You can surrender in any, every wound that you've experienced. You can surrender how you spend your time. You can surrender your work ethic. You can surrender, you can surrender every issue of your heart. So just as you leave here today, do business with the Holy Spirit. Take some time to say, this, this is something you need to do daily anyway. Just search me and know me. What area have I not surrendered? What area have I resisted you in? Because this is our walk of faith. This is the faith that works. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, we bless you. And we thank you that you're always, always faithful Lord, to, to do a work in our hearts because you're making us more like Jesus. So whatever resistance there is in us, highlight it, and in your kindness, lead us to repentance because you're faithful to give life and you desire to bring life to every dead place in us. I thank you for these students. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Thank you all.